Thank you all for joining us today for the second annual Al and Marge Brown Lecture at the Robert H. Jackson Center. We're excited to present George Marshall, a man of war, man of peace, to you today. Al Brown was a staff sergeant in the Marine Corps during World War II. And following his service, he earned his bachelor's degree and doctorate in social science from the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse. <laughs> During Al Brown's tenure as the president of SUNY Brockport, he recruited Phil Zimmer to serve as the director of news services. And when Al and his wife Marge retired, they moved to Stowe, and Phil and his wife, Mary Ann, established a lasting friendship. Marge passed away in 2008, and Al passed in April of 2017. The Zimmers established this endowment fund to support a speaker series uh, in honor of Al and Marge Brown by bringing two authors to the Jackson Center each year to discuss their books uh, on World War II related topics. As Phil said, Al was a very bright comet who brightened my life and the lives of all around him. He and his equally charming wife Marge were exceptional and naming this speaker series at the Jackson Center after them is but a modest reflection of, of much of, that much of my career was molded and influenced by Al. We're also pleased to welcome the Brown children and their family to the Jackson Center today. Um, would you all please stand briefly? <clears throat> And thank you also to the Rotarians for shifting their meeting time to join us today. The Al and Marge Brown Speaker Series is administered through the Chautauqua Region Community Foundation. Uh, we have a goal of growing this fund to $10,000. And as a brief plug, the Zimmers have set up a challenge grant to match up to $4,000 worth of contributions. So if uh, any of you are feeling so moved today, please let me know. <laughs> It is our pleasure to welcome our speaker, Dr. Gerald Pops. He earned his Juris Doctorate from the University of California at Berkeley and his Doctorate in Public Administration from the Maxwell Graduate School at Syracuse as well. He served as part of the Air Force Judge Advocate Corps and as a staff member supporting the California Legislature. The majority of his academic career was spent at West Virginia University in Morgantown, West Virginia and he is Professor Emeritus there. He has long been a student of General George Marshall and authored a book entitled Ethical Leadership in Turbulent Times, Modeling the Public Career of George C. Marshall while he was at West Virginia. Jerry and his wife Marcia are long-term Chautauquans and formerly served as the host and hostess of the Everett Jewish Life Center at the Chautauqua Institution. Please help me welcome Dr. Jerry Pops. Thank you, Kristen, and uh, thank you to the uh, special thank you to the Brown family for uh, creating the series and for inviting me. I'm I'm very flattered to be here. I'm very very proud. Uh, I uh, first came across the Jackson Center some years ago when uh, Greg Peterson showed up on our doorstep at the Everett Jewish Life Center, and we've been very good friends since then, and with Doug Neckers and. Uh, and Marion and many, many folks uh, associated with the, with the Jackson Center and with Chautauqua Institution. Uh, I am going to do uh, a review. The first thing I'm going to do is find my notes, so hang on. <laughs> ah, here they are. Then my glasses, uh, normally I use the line that I, I search around for my glasses and, and say that I wish I had brought my piano because that's where I tend to leave them. You know. <laughs> but here it is. And if, any, if anybody is interested in looking at the book, I brought a, a copy of it to glance through it. Okay, about to start. We had an excellent lunch. Man of War, Man of Peace, George C. Marshall, George Catlett Marshall. And I just today I learned for sure how to pronounce the middle name of Robert H. Jackson, which is Howitt. I didn't know that. I, I probably had said Huffwout many times and wondering I was, whether I was on the right track. Uh, 
Well, I wrote the book and I developed a liking uh, for Marshall because uh, I taught public ethics uh, in a graduate uh, program of public administration. And uh, casting about for a, an ethical giant in the field of public administration, I could find nothing. Uh, there, are, Great books are not written about great bureaucrats, can you believe it? Uh, although he was much more than a bureaucrat, obviously. Uh, so I decided, well, I'll write it. Uh, and that's, that was uh, my introduction to uh, the Marshall Library and Museum down in Lexington, Virginia, and uh, a labor of love which lasted some seven years. and Took a, a lot of our time. Marcia, my wife, edited the book and uh, we worked very hard on it. You know, at first glance, uh, George C. Marshall and uh, Robert H. Jackson uh, don't seem to have much in common. Uh, Marshall was a famous general, a warrior, uh, not scholarly uh, or well-educated uh, uh, in a formal sense, whereas Robert H. Jackson uh, was a man of letters. Uh, he was a, a literary genius as far as uh, a judge is concerned. I've never read uh, more uh, literate uh, uh, prose than I've uh, read. In, it, was, it was the top read in law school, I think. Jackson was uh, kind of in a, in a class of his, of his own. Uh, and Jackson was also, of course, a brilliant advocate, a Supreme Court justice, uh, and the prosecutor at Nuremberg. You're, of course, familiar with all, with all of that history uh, being right here. So there, there doesn't seem to be much in common, but uh, as I continued to uh, research the topic, I realized that they're uh, closely, are they coming to get me? <laughs> that they're closely linked. I didn't bomb that badly, did I? <laughs> they're linked by values. They're linked by their origins, their religion, their geography. But mainly as to uh, that there were two of the major figures in creating uh, a legacy. And I want to get to that before I finish today. And that legacy refers to international government and uh, human rights, uh, liberal democracy, uh, and uh, an international organization of all, of all types. Uh, they had a, an, an enormous impact on how we organize uh, the world and govern the world. Uh, and I'll talk more about that later. They were born 11 years and 150 miles apart in western Pennsylvania. Uh, Jackson, I guess, just south of Frisburg in, in the corner of uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, Marshall was born in uh, Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Uh, they, uh, Jackson left the farm, I guess, at an early age, around five or six years old, and came to Frisburg and went to school in Frisburg and uh, eventually uh, came here to, uh, to Jamestown. Uh, where he practiced law. Uh, Marshall uh, stayed, in, uh, stayed in Uniontown. He was not a, as I said, he's, he was a rather mediocre student. Uh, he loved history, and uh, he was a prankster. Uh, he did odd things. He, uh, he was kind of like a, a Tom Sawyer-ish character. Uh, one time uh, he, he hooked up a, a bucket of water over the front door, and when his sister's Suter came and was knocking on the door. He pulled the rope <laughs> and uh, doused him, and she never forgave him for that. <laughs> uh, he uh, roamed about the countryside a good deal. Uh, he uh, got into entrepreneurial ventures as a kid. Uh, he. Uh, grew vegetables and fruits in the backyard uh, by the, st the stream uh, behind his house in Uniontown. Uh, and uh, he uh, was, the only thing he really studied was, the, was history. The French and Indian Wars, uh, the uh, 
<clears throat> the uh, battles uh, of General Braddock uh, and the young uh, colonial British officer George Washington at Fort Necessity, uh, just outside of, uh, of uh, Uniontown. And it was about the only did he, thing he did with his father. His father was a very austere uh, man who kept his distance from his uh, children. Uh, he uh, was, uh, probably was reading about Robert E. Lee and about Fort Necessity and his uh, trips to, uh, uh, to study uh, Braddock in Washington, led him to imagine a military career. And when he was old enough, uh, he began to think about going to Virginia Military Institute, not West Point because the family had very little money, uh, and uh, he had very poor grades. Uh, and uh, he, he talked about Virginia military, and his older brother, Stuart, uh, had been at VMI, had already attended. So George thought that maybe he had a good chance to get into VMI. So something very critical happened uh, in his life one day. He, he was in the house, his house, and he heard his brother's voice talking to his mother in the living room. And he was on, George was unseen. He was in the hallway and he, he, he eavesdropped. And he heard his brother tell his mother, uh, don't let George go to VMI, he'll embarrass the family. <laughs> well, George uh, related uh, uh, later that uh, this was a pivotal event in his life. Uh, that this, uh, right on the spot, he resolved to go to VMI, to excel at VMI, and to stick it in Stewart's eye. That's exactly what he, what he said, and that's exactly what he did, I suppose, although Stewart is a, is a, a footnote in history. Uh, but they didn't have any money, so where did, how did George afford to go to VMI? His mother had a, an inheritance, a family inheritance that she had been saving for her old age. And the father had wanted that money for his business ventures, which seemed to always go nowhere. But mother uh, made sure that it all went to George for his education. So we have a lot to thank uh, Laura Marshall for, uh, to uh, get her son started in, in the right direction. So he went to VMI, uh, he arrived at VMI uh, and uh, was the top cadet every year at VMI. Not a good student, but in the mil on the military side, he was a natural leader and he loved leadership and he uh, drilled his people and he took very good care of them. And uh, when George said something, you could take it to the bank. He was absolutely, uh, had great integrity. Uh, and always followed through on, on what he said. So he was a very popular uh, leader. And he loved leadership. He liked the, uh, he, he, he said it was awesome. The, the leading men was an awesome uh, kind of uh, enterprise. And he uh, greatly uh, uh, loved doing that. Uh, I want to tell you just, uh, I hope you don't mind anecdotes, they're, they're kind of fun. <laughs> When he graduated from VMI, uh, it, it did not mean an automatic commission. Uh, so uh, what did he do? He uh, went to Washington. Uh, if you graduate from West Point, you get an Army commission. If you graduate from VMI, you've got a degree. So he went to Washington, and he asked, went to the White House, and he asked to speak to uh, President McKinley. He wanted to get permission to take an army exam. They weren't allowing him to take the commissioning exam. Maybe because they had a lot of officers at that time. Uh, so he asked to, to see the president and he was told that no, he can't see the president without an appointment and he, would, uh, he, he was not permitted to. He had to go through the channels. So he sat in the lobby nonetheless and he, he he cozied up to a family that was there, and when they were invited to go in to see the president, he went in with them. And he uh, took his seat, and uh, they had their conversation, and the family got up uh, to leave, and McKinley said goodbye, and uh, he went back to his desk, and Marshall's still sitting there. And I <laughs> said, what, are you, what, do you, what do you want, young man? Uh, what do you, why are you still here? So he told him that he wanted to be able to take the Army exam. 
McKinley was impressed. Uh, uh, this was a pattern that often repeated itself in uh, Marshall's uh, life. Uh, just a, a terribly straightforward, honest approach to things. He, he said, well, you're the president, and, and you can help me, and that's what I'd like to do. And McKinley uh, let him, gave him a letter, and he took the exam. He passed the exam. Uh, he got his commission as a second lieutenant in the Army in early 1902. He went back to VMI, where he married a sweetheart who lived on the edge of the VMI campus, and off to the Philippines, uh, Philippine Islands he went. Uh, that uh, was uh, the beginning. And I'm not going to go through every one of his assignments because that would uh, take far too long. Uh, but I do want to catch some of the highlights uh, in, his, uh, in his life. Uh, one of the, a couple of things that he did in these early assignments was, uh, number one, he, he so often had to fill in for a commander that was ill or on leave or uh, drunk or absent. So Marshall had a lot of command situations. Now this, did a, this had a very interesting effect because he always had people on the post that outranked him. Uh, senior officers in special positions like quartermasters and doctors and others that might outrank him. Uh, and so he had, he had to learn to do things by persuasion, to get his way by persuasion and not by formal command. He didn't have any formal authority over these people. Uh, so he very early on uh, learned a style of leadership uh, that was, uh, he acted by reason and persuasion, and that stood him in good stead for all his life. He went to the Army Leadership and Command School in 1907 at Fort Leavenworth and made himself the, st the top student in the school. He went as a lieutenant, and he became the top student through just dint of tremendously hard work and self-discipline. And self-discipline became a trademark in his life. He didn't believe that discipline could be instilled externally uh, by people uh, telling you, to, uh, pounding obedience into your head. That was not a way to get obedience. It had to be self-generated. It had to be created by uh, the, the individual uh, himself or herself. Uh, so that was a, a, a core belief that, that Marshall had. Uh, in the summer, uh, the, oh, after he led his class the first year, uh, he was invited by General Bell, who was later a uh, Army Chief of Staff, uh, to, uh, uh, to teach. And so he stayed on at the Army Leadership and Command School. He had studied very hard uh, logistics and tactics under a very fine professor, and he augmented that with his reading, and he taught tactics and logistics at uh, Fort Leavenworth, and he taught older officers many of them with uh, very high-ranking positions, many of whom, of them whom he would meet uh, again in World War I. So uh, that was another thing he, he did. In the summers, um, while he was at Leavenworth and afterwards, uh, he would go to, uh, he volunteered and was selected to uh, do war games, to create and oversee war games. Uh, for the Pennsylvania National Guard and in Massachusetts and Arkansas. Uh, and he, uh, it was like a laboratory. You create the war. You create the battle. You, uh, you uh, dictate what the, uh, what the terms are, the logistics, uh, the supplies, uh, the positions of the troops. And he would see what happened. He just simply uh, played games with, uh, with military, uh, like with created his own soldiers and games, except these were massive exercises involving thousands of, of people. And then he did that on a, on a full-time basis for the regular army. Uh, so he uh, went to uh, the Philippines, back to the Philippines for three years in 1913, and he um, led the war games. Now he was uh, a major, he had advanced to major, and he uh, uh, he was seen by Hap Arnold, General Arnold, uh, who uh, watched him, uh, who was, he was writing his wife, and he said, I've just seen uh, 
uh, a man lying on a hill in a clump of bamboo uh, dictating uh, or analyzing uh, a huge battle going on in the plains below him uh, and, uh, and determining the precise uh, um, uh, direction of attack that ought to be taken. I'm watching a, a future chief of staff uh, in action. <laughs> And uh, that was uh, very true. Uh, he, in World War I, let's get to that, he uh, was uh, assigned to the 1st Infantry Division as the uh, Chief Operations Officer. Now one problem he had was he was always a staff officer. Uh, he didn't have a command of troops. Uh, he, he was always doing administrative tasks. And so, uh, if you're a staff officer, you don't advance up the, the, uh, in rank very quickly. You, uh, you, you, know, you stay down at the, at the lower levels. And that was a real problem for him. He was thinking of leaving the Army, but he was convinced by uh, a friend of his who was a superintendent at VMI to stay. That Don't worry, there's a nice war coming up. Um, uh, hang in, uh, you'll have plenty of opportunity, uh, and so forth. And he was encouraged to, uh, uh, to stay. He had a mental breakdown in that period, and he taught himself as a result to, uh, to play a lot more and uh, to ride his horse. He, was a, uh, he loved to uh, go out riding. He organized uh, all the children on the post uh, uh, in games and leagues and uh, played with him. He had no children. He and his wife had no children. She had a very bad heart. And uh, he was uh, a social animal in, in, in many ways. He went to Japan. Uh, he uh, visited Japanese military bases and, uh, and key personnel, key officers. He learned a lot about Japanese fighting tactics, and he came back and taught the officers uh, back in the Philippines what he had learned about uh, Japanese tactics and uh, became rather expert in, uh, in Japanese warfare. Uh, World War I comes about and he's on the first uh, ship uh, with the 1st Infantry Division on the way to France and he's there for the whole time and uh, as operations officer for the 1st Infantry Division, uh, again he has no fighting position, he doesn't have command of troops. Uh, but he uh, has a lot of responsibility. He has to work with the French and the British to coordinate training operations uh, because the Americans uh, have to be trained in trench warfare. Uh, this occurred in 1917. And Pershing didn't want them to go into battle for a year or so until they were heavily trained. Well, this did not sit too well with French and, and British commanders that desperately needed uh, help lines. But uh, Pershing was hard to move, and uh, Marshall did a lot of the training for the 1st uh, Infantry Division. Uh, but eventually, the Americans went, uh, went into the line. And he developed a, uh, a, a perspective which allowed him to see the problems of people in the field, the, the field officers and the, and the, and the uh, rank and file, the, the men in the trenches and the, the men on the ground, uh, as well as later when he went to headquarters, under Pershing, uh, he, uh, he got a view of all the headquarters problems and saw the war from a different perspective, uh, massive logistics, uh, shipping of goods and supplies, warehousing, uh, uh, major battle plans, coordination with allies, and all those things. So there, there was, he saw the warfare from two perspectives, and that was very important uh, to his education. He was transferred to headquarters and was the uh, wrote the operations uh, plan for the largest battle of the war, the pivotal battle of uh, uh, San Mihil and uh, the uh, Moose River Argonne Forest. And he uh, wrote a plan that allowed uh, the, a movement of 600,000 uh, troops of American and French from one battlefield, the first battlefield of the San Mihil front, and while they were engaged against the Germans, they quietly moved 600,000 troops uh, to another place on the front, the, Arg uh, the Moose River and the Argonne Forest, up 
of the, to the Northwest so smoothly that the Germans never caught on. Unbelievable. Uh, and this was over rutted roads and uh, under incredibly difficult uh, conditions uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, German spies probably around and uh, managed to carry, carry that off. And uh, uh, he was hailed by the Army top leadership as the genius of logistics of World War I. Now, had Marshall retired at that point, he would have gone down as a, a great military figure. Uh, but he wasn't done. And uh, he was uh, selected by Pershing as Pershing's top aide at the end of the war. And so he uh, did various things for Pershing. And one of the things that Pershing had him do was to uh, go and uh, visit the German border areas after the war. So Marshall went into Germany, and what he uh, witnessed shocked him. What he found was a total collapse of the German society. All the civil, all the civil engineers, uh, all the governmental people, all the railroad people, the transportation people, uh, all those people that, that a community needs to run a society, food production, distribution, they were all, had been lost in the war. Um, who knows where they were, uh, and the people were starving, and uh, he, he saw all this firsthand. Now, he didn't hold animosity uh, against them because they were German. These were just ordinary civilians, and he had a, a very big place in his heart for, um, for civilians, always tried to keep them out of harm's way in, uh, in warfare. Uh, and he resolved there and then that if he ever had that decisions to make, he would uh, make civil governance at the end of a war upon retaking territory that was conquered or liberated, that he would make it a high priority to bring uh, civil governance uh, to that society to, to prevent the kind of awful suffering that, uh, that he witnessed. So he traveled with Pershing and uh, eventually came back to the U.S. where he served with Pershing for about five years. Pershing was made chief of staff in Washington. Marshall helped him learn all about politics, uh, national legislation. Uh, both of them, uh, mostly at Marshall's urging, became uh, great uh, supporters of the, uh, the Citizens' Army. Uh, growth of the National Guard, growth of the reserves, uh, reserve officers uh, components and so forth, uh, and a reduced regular army, but uh, the citizen backup was going to be the key uh, to the army in the future. Well, uh, that went uh, south, that idea after that, because of American isolationism, uh, the public uh, uh, revulsion uh, to the to World War I warfare, uh, but mainly the economic depression of the uh, 1930s uh, meant all the most of the funding for the military dried up. The National Guard units basically were dissolved, uh, and America had very little. By 1930. Eight. They had an army of 175,000 regular army and about 75,000 National Guard and reservists, of a total of about 250,000, uh, working with uh, obsolete equipment, World War I equipment, and um, rated uh, in the uh, World Survey of uh, Military Survey as the 18th strongest army uh, in the world just behind Bulgaria. So uh, you can imagine uh, it was in very uh, uh, tough shape. Uh, Marshall, uh, in the, uh, after serving with uh, Pershing for a while, he uh, really wanted to get back to troops. So he, he did three years in China uh, with troops. And then he came back to Washington. And in 1927, almost ended his career. His wife died uh, without children. Uh, he was teaching, he was uh, assigned as an army inst uh, instructor at the War College. He hated it, hated Washington. Uh, and uh, 
he was devastated uh, by everything. He was ready to quit the military. Uh, he was depressed. He went to Pershing for consolation. Now, how many, do, how many of you know that in 1915, uh, Pershing, while he was uh, down uh, chasing Santa Ana in Mexico, lost his wife and his three daughters in a fire at the Presidio in San Francisco. And uh, so when he turned to Pershing, Pershing responded. And uh, almost like he regarded Marshall as a son, I think, and, and uh, did something else for him besides console him. He sent him to be the, the f functionally the dean of the Infantry Officer School at Fort Benning, Georgia. Now that may sound uh, not too impressive to you, uh, but it was uh, one of the key events in the preparation for World War II because Marshall revolutionized Army officer training at Fort Benning, uh, and he also uh, uh, cured himself. He regained his equilibrium. He got married, and he inherited a family. His uh, new wife had three children. Her husband had been a lawyer, and he was murdered and she had three children. And so Marshall uh, suddenly had a, uh, a new family. And uh, he had a, a life, and he uh, also identified, while he was at Fort Benning, almost all the general officers that he would select in World War II. So that's when he, he met and uh, worked with guys like uh, Patton, Matthew Ridgway, uh, Truscott, uh, Hodges, uh, Bradley, and the list goes on and on. I think altogether uh, he met and identified among instructors and students about 60 generals uh, at, uh, at Fort Benning. Uh, so that was a, uh, a tremendous event. He also integrated the, the infantry training with other army functions like armor, artillery, air, supplies, medicine, uh, communications, uh, and he uh, really revolutionized the way we think about uh, Army units and, and how they operate. Uh, and he, uh, he was good at it. Five years there, and then he uh, went off to a series of posts where he worked with, uh, starting in 1932, up to about 38, he worked with uh, CCC. You know what that is? The Civilian Conservation Corps. And it was a New Deal program. Uh, and uh, it, was, it took young boys and men uh, from uh, poverty backgrounds, uh, took them out of wherever, farms, cities, all, all kinds of cities all over the country, all kinds of circumstances, all colors, all, all races, uh, all religions, and brought them into the to public service. So they built dams, they worked on roads, they built national parks, uh, everything the, that you can do. You, you've probably used the CCC uh, facilities all over the country without, without knowing it. Uh, and he led these, uh, these um, units. And, and it was probably the favorite role in his life, uh, working with these young people uh, having them educated, uh, uh, seeing them uh, uh, recover their self-respect, uh, and uh, have lives uh, to live. Uh, that was his favorite kind of duty. Uh, that brought him to 1938, and uh, he uh, returned to Washington, uh, now to the general staff. Uh, he was made the uh, head of, uh, now he was a brigadier general, and he was made the, uh, uh, the chief of the war plans division, and he began to plan uh, world war, world strategy, war strategy, and uh, he was one of the key figures in our planning for World War II, and uh, he and the uh, chief of naval operations Stark and, and Wettermeyer and some others uh, decided that uh, the best strategy would be a Europe first strategy. They were, they were assuming that we would fight both Germany and Japan. 
and that uh, the, the best course of action was to concentrate on Germany and, and run a holding operation in the Pacific. Uh, and then uh, once Germany was defeated, uh, to transfer all of those resources to the Pacific and finish the, uh, the job against the Japanese. That was the planning. Uh, and uh, then he uh, moved into deputy chief of staff position, and he did a lot of work on intelligence. He beefed up, uh, talked Congress into appropriating a lot of money for intelligence uh, and cryptographers and, uh, and really smart people. And uh, that, one of the things that, that that led to was the uh, cracking of the Japanese purple cipher in 1940. So we had some advance notice of Pearl Harbor, but we didn't know where it would happen or whether they would attack, but uh, we almost caught it. We almost did. Uh, but what it did do was, uh, with that intelligence gained from cracking the, the Japanese cipher, uh, we were able to win the Battle of Midway. Because our Navy uh, had uh, decided uh, that uh, Yamamoto, who had, was the commander at uh, Pearl Harbor, that he would take his fleet up to the Aleutian Islands and attack up there. At least that's all the breadcrumbs, you know, the, the, that's the signals he was sending us. But uh, our cryptographers in the Pacific, uh, using, uh, using the purple cipher that uh, language, which uh, they had broken, uh, decided that uh, it had to be midway that they were going to uh, go for next. And so we took the remaining carriers that we had and the remaining battleships and we sent them uh, to Midway Island and we were lucky enough to locate the Japanese and sank three of their carriers and turn the whole war around, uh, naval war in the Pacific, neutralize the Japanese advantage and that really changed the war. Uh, so uh, he worked on intelligence, uh, Oh, yeah, and one thing he did in 38 was he taught himself about strategic air power. He thought that uh, strategic air power would be a huge part of any coming war. Uh, so he looked around for top airmen and he found Frank Andrews, Andrews Air Force Base. Well, Frank, Colonel Frank Andrews was uh, the top expert in strategic air, and so uh, he enlisted. Andrews, and they went all over the country and visited aircraft plants, and uh, he took uh, like a short course, uh, a long course from Andrews, and learned everything he could about air power, strategic air power. And then when he came, became chief of staff, he basically um, brought a lot of those people into high positions and made sure that they were heavily funded uh, and created like 20 more air wings than uh, Andrews had asked for. Uh, and really uh, made a huge investment uh, in, in air power. So Marshall was thought of as the father of the American Air Force. At that time, the Air Force was part of the Army, the Army Air Corps. Uh, so he, he did that. Uh, he uh, was not first in line for chief of staff. There are many who outranked him and had uh, uh, more experience and uh, including a guy named uh, Lieutenant General Hugh Drum. Does that ring any bells? Or? Uh, Drum was the odds-on favorite because he was, uh, had all this World War I experience and he was much senior to, and he uh, was lobbying for the job and he had all of the support. And uh, Roosevelt later said that he chose Marshall because he didn't want to hear uh, Hugh beating on his drum. <laughs> so he, uh, he chose the guy who was rated as the Army's top soldier, that was Marshall, and uh, brought him in. Marshall uh, was sworn in on September 1st, 1939. Why is that an important date? World War II began on that date, September 1st, 1939, a sure ironic uh, twist of, of uh, history. Uh, so Marshall took over on that, on that date. He was in a huge hole. 
the Army was tiny. He had very little power as uh, Chief of Staff. He had all these uh, offices and parts of the Army that had linkages to Congress, and, they, uh, and the, the Chief of Staff couldn't touch them. Uh, he had all kinds of problems. He had uh, very little funding. Uh, uh, he had the Neutrality Act, which prevented America from um, uh, uh, supplying any allies. We couldn't uh, ship supplies uh, or aid allies. And we couldn't uh, use our army outside of the Western Hemisphere. All this was part of the Neutrality Act, which uh, was imposed on the, the military. Uh, and uh, uh, also, they had limitations on how many men could be in the army and, and so forth. So uh, he had to deal with those problems, and he did it all. He, uh, he reorganized his office. Uh, he reorganized the whole War Department, but couldn't change the War Department until the war actually started. Once World War II actually started, the reorganization plan was all primed and ready to go. So as soon as the war started, uh, Marshall sent the reorganization plan to Roosevelt, who signed the executive order, and Congress couldn't block it because it was war. Uh, and they were uh, almost automatically had to support it. So uh, that's what he did. Uh, now, in the meantime, uh, during this period of 39 to 41, uh, is Marshall's first interaction with Robert Jackson. Uh, they had been doing other things. Jackson had gone to Washington at the behest of uh, President Roosevelt. He was a New Deal lawyer. Uh, he fought some New Deal policy battles in the courts. Uh, he was uh, a crack advocate. Uh, uh, Roosevelt uh, talked about him as a potential presidential candidate. Uh, and uh, you can read all about this in John Q. Barrett's book um, called That Man. How many of you have read John's book? There are a few. I, I highly recommend it. It's, um, it's mostly Jackson's writings, but collected, analyzed, uh, and uh, brought together in a very creative way by John Barrett. Uh, it was the book that Marshall, that uh, Jackson probably was wanting to write once he left the Supreme Court, but he didn't quite get to it. Uh, so um, they, they met and they worked on uh, the deal with the British, bases for destroyers, where they, uh, where they uh, got bases from uh, the British in, the, in, the, in Bermuda and other places and in turn uh, gave destroyers to the British, uh, old destroyers. And the British vitally needed uh, uh, these destroyers because of submarine. Uh, the war had already commenced against uh, Britain and the German U-boats were, were uh, creating havoc and so the uh, British had to have these submarines. So they worked out that deal. And they began to lay the basis for the Lend-Lease program as well. So they were doing very creative things uh, together. And it's interesting because uh, Jackson was not a militarist, uh, but he certainly saw the relationship between the international menace of the Nazis uh, and justice and stability in, in, a, in a democratic country like ours. And Marshall was no legalist, uh, but he had a profound belief in constitutionalism, uh, the uh, subordination of military leaders to uh, elected political uh, civilian leadership. Uh, and so they worked together very easily and very productively. Uh, so the war starts, and I guess uh, Marshall must have breathe the sigh of relief uh, because now they can reorganize uh, the uh, military uh, and begin to uh, go about the business of uh, fighting. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, wallets opened up in Congress and the uh, uh, Congress uh, started to very generously support the military uh, and uh, uh, and the military was uh, was off and running. Are there any questions to, to this point that, that you'd like to ask? 
be happy to take take one or two. So, uh, but if not, just hold them, and I'll I'll just continue. Uh, so the um, they work together easily, uh, and now uh, in the first couple of uh, months of the new war of World War II, uh, there uh, occurs what is called the Arcadia Conference in D.C., where the British and the uh, American high command and political leaders get together uh, to talk about what how they're going to run the Allied war effort. Uh, so they have to organize it, and who uh, who emerges as the top military leader in the world? <laughs> Marshall, and uh, he creates the uh, his ideas are really at the center of creating the unity of command structure of the Allied uh, military, uh, and uh, also the combined chiefs of staff. I think that's the British idea. Uh, so the American chiefs of staff and the British. Chiefs of Staff, military chiefs get together in what's called a combined chief of staff, combined chiefs of staff. And uh, that's one thing that forms. Uh, and uh, Marshall establishes a British staff office in the Pentagon or in the War Department uh, to heighten communication and working together in joint planning and so forth. That's Marshall's idea. Uh, and also uh, the uh, 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 there is uh, a lot of uh, planning that, uh, that's going on. From the very beginning, Marshall is uh, insistent upon a cross-channel invasion of France as, as his preferred strategy for fighting the Germans. He wants to mount the attack in uh, the force in Britain and attack across the channel uh, and go right into France to take advantage of American military prowess uh, because we're starting to create a large tank force. Uh, we, have, we, will be, we will have air superiority in the not too distant future at that point, and we have an, un an, an unequal supply of uh, reserve fuel. Uh, so it's, and you operate on a flat topography in Western Europe in, in France. Uh, so there were great advantages to attacking uh, through, through France. Churchill opposed that. Uh, the British uh, chiefs were, uh, were still rocking from their terrible experiences in World War I. They lost so many men, but I don't know, about 10 times what we lost. And they um, also had just been expelled from the continent at Dunkirk, 1940. So uh, they had no appetite for going back. And I think they may have been right. They, they talked Roosevelt into going into North Africa first. Uh, and I think that was the right thing to do because I think uh, American troops uh, had to be what the British called blooded. And uh, also the British had to have some victories to regain their self-respect. And that happened uh, in North Africa. And uh, I, I know Marshall brought Patton in as a uh, top tank commander. That's a, that's a funny anecdote. Uh, he uh, telegraphs um, Patton, and he said, uh, I would like you to serve as the head of a tank division in North Africa. Uh, would you uh, please contact me and let me know when you'll be here uh, to take command? So Patton answers, and he says, uh, yes, I'm, 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 I'm very interested in, in leading uh, a tank unit, but can I have a corps instead of a division? That's like three divisions. So uh, Marshall responds by sending Patton a telegram telling him he's assigned to the tank school in Palm Desert. <laughs> Whereupon uh, uh, Patton responds to Marshall with a, a very apologetic note. <laughs> Uh, almost on his knees verbally asking, uh, apologizing. See, he'll take any, anything that Marshall has. <laughs> and so, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. Patton goes to North Africa. British and American tank forces uh, fight valiantly. The Americans are saved by 10 minutes? Okay. Uh, they have 10 minutes to win the war. <laughs> 
Uh, they uh, have wonderful weather at the landing, uh, and uh, they survive, and they beat the Germans. But then Churchill wins the next round. Uh, now that they have North Africa, uh, Churchill convinces uh, Roosevelt that they should go into Sicily and Italy, which is not good ground for the Americans. But Churchill wins that battle, and, uh, and they have to go. Uh, let me cut to uh, end of war decisions, and then I'll finish on uh, my thesis. Uh, in the, uh, at the end of the war, uh, Marshall, before the end of the war, 1942, that's the worst year of the war for us. We're on our heels. Uh, we're backing up everywhere around the world. Marshall starts planning for the end of the war by uh, creating a civil governance unit within the uh, general staff. He's, he's already planning for what he's going to do with conquered and liberated territories that we're going to take <laughs> in 42. And in, and in addition to that, he, st he, uh, he creates a secret task force to, to start planning for fair demobilization of forces at the end of the war. So in 42, we begin the process of deciding how we're going to release people at the end of the war. And that has to be secret, because if it gets out to the public, the public will think, oh, well, the war is almost over. Uh, we, don't have to, we don't have to send the big dollars to Washington. We don't have to send our sons to fight and so forth. Uh, so uh, it had to be secret. But those, those things began in 1942. They came to fruition later. Uh, amazing uh, farsightedness uh, of, uh, of Marshall. Uh, I could conclude and I'll tell you that uh, Marshall undoubtedly was the single most important individual in preparing for world, uh, preparing, preparing America for entry into World War II. And he was probably the most single most important man in waging World War II. Churchill called him the organizer of victory in World War II, uh, and uh, he, uh, he came through it. At the end of the war, uh, he began to build the peace, and he wanted universal military th training, which he didn't get. He wanted uh, the, uh, uh, he also wanted uh, the United Nations. He, he believed in that, uh, and he wanted uh, the uh, the, again, the building of a strong National Guard and reserve units. Uh, and he wanted, he didn't want large land and sea forces. He, he didn't want separate services. He didn't want an Army, Navy, and Marines. He wanted a new organization divided functionally into land, sea, air, and supplies. No Army, Navy, Marine, and petty jealousies among the services. He didn't believe in that. Uh, so these were all things that he proposed in 1945, looking ahead. He also didn't want land large forces. He, he thought future wars would uh, consist of, th that our needs would be much sharper in focus, like uh, intelligence, communications, uh, uh, special forces, uh, espionage. He, he could see a much different world emerging. Uh, he always, uh, when he taught at Benning, he always was planning for the next war, not, not teaching the last war. Uh, so that was his direction. At the same time, Robert Jackson had been appointed by Truman uh, to uh, organize the Nazi war trials in Nuremberg and to prosecute them. So you have these two things happening about the same time. And so what's happening is that both Marshall and Jackson are becoming major figures uh, in building a, a new legacy, in, in building a uh, post-war approach uh, to world and international relations and governance. And it's based on democracy, it's based on humanism, it's based on strong international organization. Uh, eventually, when the Soviet Union becomes uh, a pain, uh, it adds NATO, and then, uh, when Marshall serves as Secretary of State in 1947, uh, he's dissatisfied with the Truman Doctrine, which is kind of a military approach to rebuilding Greece and Turkey and 
arming uh, the royalists against the communists. He doesn't like that. He, he, he sees an, an arms race coming. He doesn't want that. He thinks we can work with the Soviets, but we have to deal from a position of strength. And that means economic aid in a big way uh, with American money and American technical assistance. Uh, and most importantly, I think, European organization. Uh, the European states have to organize with each other to define their needs and then to work with the Americans in, in spending it and how to use it. And all that happens in the Marshall Plan. And he, he's willing to, he's able to sell it to Congress. It was a Republican Congress, and he's helped very greatly by Senator Arthur Vandenberg of Michigan, a Republican head of the Foreign Relations Committee. Committee. So uh, Marshall and his uh, Assistant Secretary Lovett and Vandenberg are really, uh, really brought this thing into, into being. The Marshall Plan, uh, as uh, I was talking with Bruce at lunch, worked. It worked. Uh, there's disagreements among uh, economists as to whether it was the whole uh, resurrection of Europe or a peace, but it worked. And maybe the most important thing that came out of the Marshall Plan was a 75-year alliance that still holds between Europe and the United States and Canada. That is still the basis of our foreign policy. Now, that's of the legacy that Marshall and, and, and Jackson and some others uh, helped to create. And some women, like Eleanor Roosevelt, were involved too. Uh, but that's what we have built. And we are now seeing a challenge uh, to that, uh, to that what I call paradigm, that movement. Uh, and that comes in the form of isolationism, it comes in the form of trade barriers, it comes in the form of withdrawal from international organizations like the Paris Peace Accord, uh, Peace, uh, Climate Accord, uh, and from nuclear agreements with Iran, and now in the last few days with the Soviet Union on, on intermediate uh, uh, nuclear missiles. Uh, we are seeing a disengagement, a backing away from the international uh, the, the 75 year relative peace, there have been wars here and there, yes. But among the major powers, we have not had war since 1945. And uh, we are uh, faced uh, with uh, the prospect. And we are experiencing, it's manifesting itself within the United States too, and in terms of the polarization in Congress. Uh, the, uh, the conflict between the Congress and the presidency. Um, and as a teacher of public administration, I see one of the major uh, problems is the attack on the deep state. You've heard that phrase used by Bannon and others on the deep state. Well, the deep state, my friends, happens to be the professional civil service and people that uh, are in our government and build our roads and, uh, and create our, our climate protections and build our transportation systems and so forth and so on. They are the heart of the uh, American Republic. And to denigrate and undermine the intelligence community, the law enforcement community, uh, and our chief climate scientists uh, is something we should all be concerned about and we should speak out. Thank you.